All right, guys, welcome back to the podcast. We have Mike Zabin on the podcast. Maybe just give a little bit of an intro, Mike, about who you are, what you're doing, um, just to give some context to the listeners. Sure, yeah, for sure. So my name is Mike Zabin. I am a Amazon seller. I am Canadian. I sell primarily on the .com platform, but also we sell on the .ca platform. My business partner and I have been selling on Amazon for right around three years now. And so we've, you know, taken it from zero and now we do multiple six figures every year. So it's been an exciting journey, a good and profitable business for us. And uh, that is my, really my main focus right now and what I'm here to talk about with you guys today. That's awesome. So I think there's a lot to unpack there. Um, but before we really dive in into that side of everything, uh, given the recent events, so there's an elephant in there right now for all the Canadian listeners. And the reason probably a lot of people are going to tune in initially or even find this episode is because they're going to be searching up for content around these Amazon limits that have just been implemented in Canada. Um, so I know you just mentioned that you obviously are big on the uh, American platform.com. Um, but has this change has it affected you at all yeah so i think what most people have noticed what i've been reading and talking to people about is initially we got the the inventory restriction and that was like a hard 200 units in amazon warehouses and that's the way it was i've been trying to just kind of sit back sit on the sidelines luckily we didn't have like a shipment waiting to go in you know at that exact moment and so I've seen over the past number of days, I think it's at the time of recording, it's been about three, four days now since this actually hit five days, it looks like. And uh, our limit has actually went up since. So we are at a point where we can actually still, we have capacity and we can still send in inventory. Mm. So that's kind of been the experience thus far. When it first hit, we were obviously, you know, over our limit. And it basically said, you're good, but you cannot send anything else in until you hit below that limit. It seems as if they are slowly creeping that up. I seem to check every day and we have a few more units every single time. So it's looking like it's trending in the right direction, but definitely it was a huge shock and it was a tough pill to swallow to know that potentially we could be limited and capped in what we can do in the Canadian market. So I'm still kind of watching and seeing uh, how it's going to impact or unpack over the next, you know, several days and weeks. Yeah. And it's, it's a huge change. Um, and obviously you're smart in the sense that you, I don't like using the term lucky because it's not lucky. You are smart to actually, you know, move your business to, I don't know if you moved or if you, but whatever, but you're on .com, which is smart because now you're in, you know, at least two different markets because you are on the, on the .ca, but for like people selling like books, like this is a, like for my business, it, it, it ruins my business to be honest. Um, you know, we had 5,000 active listings and like, I'm not a person that panic. I'm sitting similar to you just kind of see what happens because the reality is, is like even Amazon wants to grow their business in Canada. They do. Like I, this isn't a, stra a strategy that would allow them to do that long term. So it's really probably just a way to rattle the cage a little bit and have a lot of people dispose of old inventory that hasn't been moving. Starting today, you know, they're telling us that we can remove inventory for free. A lot of people are going to be doing that. A lot of people. And on top of that, a lot of people won't be sending stuff in and sales are happening. So they're going to free up a ton of space over the next couple of weeks. And I would assume, I would hope that a lot of these restrictions will be, you know, raised quite a bit because they probably will keep some kind of system in place that limits you to, in a sense, similar to the, the States with the IPI score, Canada needs it because it basically was a free for all. But what do you think about the fact that they made it um, nine months in older accounts? So they're kind of penalizing in a way experienced sellers, but if you have a new account, you can send all you want in. Yeah, so what I think is happening, I'll answer that question, but with the situation as a whole, yeah. I think it's exactly what you said. 
you know, long-term storage fees don't kick in until 12 months. So I think there was probably a lot of people that would just send in, you know, way too much inventory. They would say, if it sells, it sells, you know, we have six months, eight months, 10 months to get rid of this at very minimal, you know, monthly storage fees. And so they were just over sending inventory and we're just seeing a little bit of a trickle down effect from some of the measures that they've implemented you know, in the States with IPI scores, ASIN level restrictions. And I think that is needed, that needs to be in place because as diligent, you know, successful, profitable sellers, we need to think about inventory on hand. We need to think about, you know, being able to actually flip that inventory. It, it forces you to be a little bit more um, diligent and mindful of your cash flow, the inventory you have on hand, all of those types of things. So I think as long as they roll it out the right way, it is a really positive thing overall. Uh, but specifically looking at accounts nine months or older, I don't know where they came up with that number, why that's the case. Maybe they're seeing that, you know, there's a huge drop off in sellers until you hit, like there's a huge drop off until you hit that nine months. And then if people are there, they, they tend to stay on longer. I would imagine it's a way for them to entice or allow newer sellers to, you know, figure out their footing, understand the way the business works, ease into it a little bit. Um, you know, as a new seller, you're probably going to see happen to us. I'm sure it happens to everybody. You send in a bunch of different inventory and you think you've done the best product research you can, maybe you have, and inventory just doesn't perform the way you want it to, you know, prices tank, bunch of competitors hop on the listing, you know, um, it's a seasonal product or a fad product. And it, you know, the interest in that dies down, like there's a number of different things that can happen. So I think it's their way to just allow the freedom to the newer sellers to figure out, you know, gain their footing and be able to operate within the platform as opposed to them hopping on and having these tight restrictions that might deter them. And I also think that it's their way to attract big sellers that are not already on Amazon. So if you have like those big eBay sellers, you have, um, you know, a company that has their own online, like first party website, and now they also want to sell on Amazon or big brands that have tons and tons of SKUs, inventory, all of that kind of stuff. They can still operate within the first nine months, get comfortable with Amazon. They don't want to keep those people off and they want to give as much opportunity to the newer sellers, people new to the platform, whoever they might be. So that's my thought on it. That's what I think is happening. Is that correct? Is that what's going on? I don't know. To be honest, I don't I, like we don't know what they're thinking, but that's that's what I'm thinking at this point. Yeah, I would agree. It's and it's just so tough to say. It like it's like there was no warning to it though. That's the part. Like like I I don't disagree or agree with it. Like it's unfortunate for me that it directly affects my business, but like I feel like they're very strategic in what they do and they they have reasons for it. But no matter what, like if you want people to be on your platform, make livings on it, I feel you should maybe give some heads up as to what's going to happen rather than one day, just boom. But I mean, that's, you know, that, I guess that's just a conversation for another day, my personal kind of vibe. Now, just to get away from that, cause this conversation going all day and then get a little mucky. So we'll go back to regular programming. You could say, um, so I am kind of curious though, because you know, the Canadian reselling, business in terms of content stuff like that there's not a lot a lot of content out there so one thing we definitely thank you for your work you're doing because um you know as a canadian you're kind of representing us well which i, I appreciate but maybe talk to us a little about how you started on amazon and how you ended up where you are now in terms of the dot com and like did you start on dot ca like what's the story there sure yeah for sure so i initially got into amazon through the drop shipping model. That's how I was kind of pulled onto it. I, I really learned about it through social media and just different people that I had followed kind of in the entrepreneur space and just really the reselling space in general. So I actually started with a different business partner. We launched the account that we're still operating on today and we were drop shipping for the first couple months. Uh, I quickly learned it's not something that is both 
really viewed well in the eyes of Amazon, as well as something that I wanted to do. I didn't find that it would be very sustainable. I wasn't able to create those kind of lasting relationships that would give me the inventory and supply that I needed. And I saw it as kind of a really short-sighted or short-term way for me personally to grow the business. I'm not, not knocking it, not saying, you know, it's not for someone else. Uh, so that's why we made the shift over to wholesale, actually stopped selling for a couple of months. The account just kind of sat the way it was, took all my listings off. And then I found another business partner who was interested. We ended up finding a mentor uh, out of California and we took a kind of a one-on-one -on -one mentorship with him. And because of that, he was teaching on .com. We realized the potential and opportunity on .com in terms of the market, the velocity that you can see, and just really the potential that's there even as a Canadian. So we did a bit of drop shipping in .com and .ca to start, moved over to entirely wholesale, and that's what we do now, um, primarily on .com. So you could say like our first real shot at it where we really were serious about it was .com. And then we've slowly crept back into .ca. And uh, we actually just last year kind of revamped our business and started to double down in um, one niche. And so we've been, you know, collecting distributor leads, opening up accounts with all of these different distributors within our niche. And we did the same uh, on the .ca side, just because we were comfortable in that space. So now we're growing kind of both businesses simultaneously. So I would, I would say still our, our sales are 85% .com, maybe 15% .ca type thing. But um, yeah, we are, we are open in both marketplaces and actively selling on both. Okay. So, so you really started, so you kind of did the opposite of what a lot of Canadian <laughs> sellers do in the sense is that you started on the .com and now you're kind of starting to branch more onto the .ca side of things, which I think is smart, especially with, uh, I think grocery in Canada has a huge potential as they start rolling out more fulfillment centers, like here in Halifax, um, they recently just purchased some real estate to build a fulfillment center, which will allow maybe someday, like the, you know, in the States, they have like the one day prime shipping, which I don't know a ton about that, but just from traveling, I've, I've seen it there. Um, so grocery in Canada, I think is a huge potential point for, for, for Canadians in terms of shopping. Cause a lot of people don't do it yet really. Um, and for sellers, I think there's a, there's a huge potential there as well. So that's something that I'm definitely looking at. But uh, so are there any kind of opportunities that you currently see that you haven't explored it yet, but you might down the road or, or something that you ha or you won't do, but you think would be a good idea for somebody to do? Yeah, uh, for us, it's really growing that .ca business. Gotcha, it's yeah. not as big as we'd like it to be. Yeah. And I'm actually, you know, through the people that I talk to, the students that I'm teaching and helping along, and their, their first question is, I'm in Canada. Do I sell on .ca or .com? And I'm just like, honestly, I like .ca. I wish that we would have started on .ca. The reason we didn't is because we chose a mentor who is an expert in the .com platform, taught us everything about that. Even though that there are you know, a lot of similarities, it's still Amazon. There's definitely nuances to .ca that are different from .com. So we want to grow our .ca business. We want the ability to start fulfilling our own inventory locally, help mm. you know, manage costs that way, create relationships with both suppliers, freight companies, all of that kind of stuff. So that's where I see the opportunity. The marketplace is growing. Um, hopping a little bit back on to what you were saying before about the ASIN restrictions, all of that kind of stuff. In that piece of news or correspondent, they actually started it with saying that they're opening new fulfillment centers in 2021 in Canada. So, you know, Halifax is one of them here. We're over in Alberta, uh, in Edmonton and actually like 20 minutes South of where I live, they've been working on this massive warehouse. I think it's the biggest one in Canada and they're partially rolled out. Actually, my brother works at one of the warehouses here or that warehouse, I should say they're like 25% open or something like that right now. So they have tons of room for expansion. And like you were saying, the whole one day shipping, I, we, I've actually ordered things and received them the same day, 
like I'll order it at 7 a.m. receive it at like 9 p.m. It's already happening in in Canada, and I think that's going to widely roll out. And because of that, as well as just the general demand of Amazon, I think the opportunity is greater now than ever to be on .ca because it's it's an emerging market for sure. Oh, it is big time. And so I obviously I'm big in the books, but I dabbled in other categories, and it was it was once I made some good connections in books is why I, I kind of pivoted there, but now I'm going to might have to pivot away a little bit. Um, I was kind of looking at grocery. I was making listings and like just going to the grocery store and looking at very common or not even just any, any store, like very common things that you think would be on Amazon. But a lot of those products are not on Amazon in Canada yet. And then you look on .com and there's like 40 different variations of it. So I'm very bullish on the Canadian market. Um, and the sooner you get your, brand established, you get your reviews up, get your relationships established. You're kind of poised, in my opinion, for growth. And like I made a list and I mean, it's gone to shit. So I don't mind saying it, but it was for Mio. Um, so I just, and actually keep, I don't know if you use keep at all, but you can do extremely good product research on keep. They have like a product finder tool where you can like filter products by category and it's really nice. So you can actually go and, um, Go and keep a product finder, maybe find um, grocery, the top 5,000 that Amazon's not on. And you can actually say it's uh, a chocolate bar that sells for some reason for like $12, but people buy it. You can go and make a two pack of it because that, that stuff's just not being done yet. So I'm very bullish on the Canadian side of things. And will I take advantage of it? I don't know. But I know someone like you will definitely do extremely well. So um, I'm happy to to hear you kind of saying that you're, you're bullish on the Canadian market because I am as well. And hopefully when these fulfillment centers open, you know, some of this restriction stuff will get uh, worked out a little bit, but fairly recently, I noticed that you did launch the elite wholesale. Maybe just talk about like when that launched happened and maybe you're still in the beta of it and what it's all about for the listeners. Yeah. So elite wholesale is essentially comprehensive program. So it kind of takes you A to Z on selling on Amazon, how to start up your your business, how to do the product research, how to find suppliers. It's completely based on wholesale. So if you're, you know, thinking about wholesale, even book reselling, anything like that, it goes kind of A to Z on that. And then there's a whole back end of it that has support. So we have a a private community channel uh, within the platform that I use that all of our students interact with, ask questions, all of that kind of stuff, as well as I do live ongoing tra- training. So every second Wednesday, I'm actually going live, doing Q&A sessions with the students, as well as delivering trainings and updates. So, you know, the ASIN level restrictions, that's a good update that we might be talking about and elaborating on in one of these or new product research methods, whatever that might be. So. Mm-hmm. I created this program because when I first started, uh, I mentioned I did that one-on-one mentorship. Well, that was like a really p- premium product. I mean, granted, the seller we took it from, he's he's in like a probably an eight-figure seller now. Um, so he's an expert, knows what he's doing, but it was a really premium product and that premium you know price tag that came with it. And then I also noticed on the other end of the spectrum, kind of these... T- you know, I'll call it half-assed courses that people either don't sell themselves, you know, actively, or it's old outdated information, or it's just really not that well put together. And there's no back-end support. Like you buy it for X amount of dollars, you go through it, whether you learn something or not, you know, it is what it is. So I wanted to find something um, kind of a middle ground. So someone who is selling is having success with it, wants to share that knowledge, gives the back end support where you know you can ask questions um the course is constantly being updated i'm adding to it right now like you mentioned it's actually still in beta right now so it's not even a full launch i'm like 80 percent done all of the course material right now so that's why i created it that's what it's all about and we're changing lives we're getting people's businesses started and it's been you know a, a success so far and i'm looking forward to really growing it as time goes on. So the feedback has been good on it so far. Um, other students, are you finding they're, they're Canadian, American, or is it a mix of both? Uh, I think we have one Canadian. Yeah. We actually have, uh, I think three, three guys are from like the EU. 
Netherlands, kind of that area, so across the sea, and then the rest are all uh, from the U.S., as far as I know. So a really healthy mix um, kind of, of around the world of students, and I, I see it growing in that area, in that vertical. Um, the reason for that is a lot of my social media following ends up being from the U.S., yes, just because, you, you know, the most of the content I put out is on .com, yeah. U.S., uh, a lot of the friends and partnerships I've made through the business are all located down in the U S so that's just been the nature of it. But I really tried to make the program inclusive for everybody and really have content and information no matter what marketplace you're selling on. So that's a goal with it. Positive feedback so far. Um, it, it is relatively fresh. Like I launched kind of mid to late December there. So it's only been going a few months at this point. And right now I'm just really focused on student success and progress. So, yeah, no, that's, that's super. I'm, I'm happy to see you do that. Cause I think you're kind of the right guy for it. And like, when you think of Amazon courses, it's a mucky questionable thing only because of the, like the ads you see on YouTube are like painful. So it's nice to see someone who's actually doing it. Yeah. Offer the course. You know, there's a few people that are offering courses that are in it, but there's a lot more people that failed at it and then decide to teach it. You know what I mean? So it's nice to see someone like you, like, like out there doing it. So, so that's really good to see. Um, what are some of like the common pitfalls you see people make when starting on Amazon or scaling? Yeah. So I would say keep some of the pitfalls really would just be not putting in the work. Like I couldn't tell you how many people, None of my students yet, but how many people hit me up and they're like, oh, I've been doing this for like four months, but I can't find any good suppliers. I can't find any good products. I can't find, you know, this or that, this or that. And I'm like, well, how many leads have you brought in? Like, like, do you have a list and you're writing them down as you go, right? They're like, yeah. Like, how many do you have? They're like, oh, 20 or 30 so far. And, you know, I've contacted them over a span of four months. No one's getting back to me or I'm not able to open accounts. I've opened a couple and the products are no good. I'm like, man, when I started this, I lined up like 100, 150 leads. And not until I did that did I start reaching out to them, contacting them. Like, the, the amount of work ethic that you actually have to put into this can you, can you do two, three hours a day? And as long as you're consistent, you know, get there. Definitely. That's how I recommend most people do it is just in your free time, start it up, spend the time that you can, but you cannot expect to spend, you know, three or four hours and just have all the products in the world to buy and just, you know, be able to dump your money onto it. Um, the other thing is doing improper product research. People come to me and I've literally had people send me like keep graphs the products that they bought, the price they bought it at. Like they just laid it all out because they're like, I'm helpless. I don't know what to do. Like I need help with this. And I look at it, like I look at the keep graph and it's like, well, you know, COVID happened and prices just went like this. So they bought where they could be profitable way up here and then supply kind of caught up prices went right back down. Mm. They can't make a dime on it. Right. So just knowing, being able to know the market, having some background knowledge, knowing how to do your product research, knowing what you're getting into is super important. So, I mean, that comes right back to it where it's like, I'm a huge believer in courses, mentorships, masterminds, communities, like whatever you want to call it investing in knowledge from people that have done it, people that, you know, are actively doing it and know what they're doing and are reeling that information. Like we've probably spent for sure have spent north of 10, maybe creeping up on 20 grand now just on knowledge for ourselves, investing in our business to know how to do things better, how to do things quicker um, to, you know, just how to operate our businesses better. So, I mean, it's, it's not quick. It's not easy. A lot of the times it's not cheap, but if you're willing to put in the work, willing to put in the effort and you're getting the right information from the right sources, it's not too late. Like there's, there's so much opportunity out there and all of the marketplaces on Amazon are simultaneously growing bigger than they ever have been. So even with thousands of sellers hopping on the platform, it's you can definitely find your place and, and find the products that you need to sell. So with that be, being said, what do you tell the sellers or the people starting out? Cause this is a common one too, that maybe they're literally starting it on a credit card. Like they have no money 
and they, they, maybe they want to hop on these courses and they want to do the learning, but they're scared to take on additional debt to get going. Like what's the mind? Like, obviously you probably shouldn't start a business on a credit card, but there's probably worse things you could put on a credit card and there's people that are going to do it anyway. So what, what kind of advice would you give someone like that? Yeah. So I'm completely transparent with people. If they reach out and they're like, is your course for me? Is Amazon for me? You know, what do I need to do? And I'm just like, I've only done wholesale, you know, done a little bit of OA through drop shipping, but like, if you want to do wholesale, you need some capital to start, right? Yeah, yeah. If you come and you're like, I, I have a $3,000 credit card and I want to put it on there. It's not going to be for you because there's no way that you can go out, buy product, send it into Amazon, have the product sell through and get a payout from Amazon inside of a month. Right. And that's, that's the leeway that you get with a credit card. So I always recommend you got to have like at least, you know, a thousand to $2,000 would be a decent starting budget. If you can have like three, 3,500 bucks, that's a, a good budget to start the business off with and you can be successful. Um, but really the more cash that you're able to put into it, the more successful you're going to be because you can buy more products, you can do more testing, you can, you know, set yourself up in a better position quicker. So I'm always really honest and transparent. Like if you have less than a thousand dollars to get into this business, just go out, get a job, start saving up. Like if it takes you six months to save up that thousand dollars, it is what it is. You got to do it, but you know, take care of your, your livelihood, take care of your bank account, your savings and get yourself in a position where you can properly start this business or else you're just starting off, you know, you're, you're putting yourself in a really bad position to start and there's already enough things on Amazon and in this business that are working against you. Trust mm -hmm. me, you don't want your, your budget or your initial startup costs to be uh, one of those things. So, no, I think that's super smart advice. And then, like I've done RA, like I've, you know, I really personally haven't done much wholesale because I find wholesale a little daunting as probably many people do. And the one thing that's always got me hung up, you know, look at the Keepa, look at your, your profits and stuff like that. And maybe you negotiate a good price, but there's always that question, especially with, okay, when the ball is going and you've got a bunch of products and it's all good, no problem. You can take some probably a little more risk on, on product. But when you're just getting started, like I can imagine, especially for students, like it's tough to make that first, like say you save that five grand and you're going to make your first like wholesale order it's not like you're just putting it in a grocery store and the price is the price. Like there's potential that you get competition and your first order goes to shit. Like, is that something that you, you teach in the, in the, in the course, or is that something that people should worry about? Like, like it just seems risky. Yeah. So what I actually teach in the course is, I mean, first off, proper product research, right? Yeah. If you're reading your keep graphs, you're taking a look at, the market, the history of that product, you're wanting to make sure that it has a proven track record of, you know, uh, a certain amount of sellers, right? Without getting too deep into the minutia of actual criteria or numbers, you want to make sure it has a consistent number of sellers. You want to make sure that the price is relatively consistent. You want to make sure that it has a good sales velocity and your piece of that pie or your piece of the sales velocity that you can expect is something that you can rely on is consistent and is going to be a lot higher than what you actually make for that initial order. Right. So let's say something is selling, just to give an example, something sells hundred units a month and there's only three sellers on it currently, right? So you're hopping on as that fourth seller. So you can expect 25 units a month in sales. So for that first order, I would do like 12. And that's the beauty of wholesale is you can open up an account and you can order 12, 24, 36 units of a product, right? And I recommend that students go in and just for their first products, like cherry pick the best ones. Like find something that for the last 12 months has sold like within a 10% price range the whole time. It's always consistently had five different people selling on it. You know, the BSR is consistent between, you know, a certain range, a certain rank the entire time. And then like buy something at a price point where you can have a pretty decent margin, like a 20 plus percent margin type thing, right? right. And because you don't have 
a business and bills and overhead and all of these different things that are relying on you bringing products in every single day or week and selling through those products just to maintain the business. You don't have those added pressures. You can really take your time and figure out what these, the best products are. So when you make that first order, it comes through and it doesn't go exactly as expected. Like you're still turning a profit. You're still able to sell through the product. You're still able to do that. Right. So inside the course, I teach all of these different methods. I teach exactly like the different criteria that we look for when we're purchasing. And then I also teach mitigating the risk between a number of different items. So like if you had five grand, you're probably buying, I don't know, it depends on the price point of the products to be honest, but you could buy 10, 20, 30 different SKUs or types of products and just buy like 12 or 20 of each of those. Mm. That way, if there's say you bought 30, 20 are winners and 10 are losers you should be, you should be net positive on that. Right. You're going to learn lessons. You're going to learn kind of how each category has its nuances and cycles as you go through the year and all of those types of things. And then as you get comfortable and, and you're reordering from your suppliers and all of that kind of stuff, you just, you have more confidence every sure. single time. Right. So set yourself in a situation where you can, you almost can't lose. And then if it doesn't go as well as expected, like you're still ahead of the game. Well, I think it's a key point in there where you mentioned the healthy margin, um, a lot of people start and they get excited, you know, and they just want to sell like, Oh, like I can make $2 off this. That's amazing. But then it's like a 12% margin and you have no room for air there. Right. So I think it's a smart point where you can really put yourself in a good position. If you send in a product and you have a 30% margin on it, you've got some decent room there that the price could actually come down and you're still going to be profitable on it. So that's probably a key point that, I know when I first started, I was so excited. I'd be at the store scanning or looking at a wholesale list. And if it, if it could sell and it did sell, my, my, my excitement almost took me over and I would just go crazy on it. But what happens then is you tie up cash and as items are selling, like you're not making much back. So like your break even becomes hard to get to. So it, it can get into an ugly cycle there. But one thing I did want to ask you, because you mentioned you had kind of two different partners, which you don't have to talk about you know, them so much, but what is the, the value to you of having a partner? Yeah. So for me, I think it's a, it's really a personal thing and how you operate, how you like to work. I know that you yourself, you started off um, on your own yeah. and then you recently brought on a partner, right? So I'm the type of person that just works better in a collaboration. Like I've, I've always been that way. I, you know, since I went to school for kind of multiple different things at this right. point. I've worked careers and jobs and all of that kind of stuff. And I'm just, I'm better when I work in a collaborative environment. Mm. So I knew that when starting up a business, I wanted someone to be able to bounce ideas off, um, to be able to, you know, strategize with and plan. Um, sometimes I'm super optimistic about things and I'm just like, let's order a thousand of these because they're going to kick ass. And my partner's like, well, you know, let's, let's take it mm -hmm. slow. Let's, let's take a look at this. And then other times I'm just like, um, you know, whether it's or ordering inventory or whatever, just making plans to grow and I'll be super pes pessimistic about something and he'll be like, no, like this is an opportunity we need to hit. And just having that conversation and that collaboration with somebody and you know, working things out with, with a partner has always been super beneficial for me and something that I always looked for in, uh, you know, doing business, getting stuff done and just doing work in general. So I really think it's a personal thing. You know, right. I know people that are seven, eight figure sellers that did the entire thing themselves and then just hired employees under them. And then I also know guys that, you know, started with two or three of them even and have built massive businesses. So those are the benefits for me, but to each their own, really. That's fair enough. Um, yeah, like I, I started, like you said, on my own, and I found I kind of became my own bottleneck in a sense. And since having a partner on board, it everything you just said is totally valid. So I think it's if you find the right person, they can be incredibly valuable, like with, without a doubt. Now the other tricky thing is, given the recent changes. <laughs> I don't know what that looks like for us um, going forward because it's, it's when you like, we just got started and things were just starting to amp up. So it was just now starting to maybe make some money for both of us. And then 
So I don't know what that looks like going forward, but we'll kind of see what happens. Um, but is there any kind of last pieces of advice, parting shots you want to get out there before we end the, end the call? Yeah, I would say that if you're watching this, you're not selling on Amazon, it's something you've been considering for a while, definitely make sure that you're doing your product research, you're doing your research on any sort of course mentorship, anything like that that you're gonna wanna buy. And then if you are going out and doing it on your own, it is a little different than you know posting stuff up on Facebook Marketplace or eBay and flipping it over. You do really have to treat this like a real business from day one, even if it is your side hustle, which is how probably most people start, if not everybody treat it as a real business from day one, like take it as serious as possible with the potential it could go full time. And as long as you're treating it kind of the same way you treat your career, or your job, I think that really anybody can be successful with the right education and resources. No, I appreciate that with those words a lot. I think you're a very smart, smart person. And I appreciate your time for today for coming on the podcast. Yes. Thank you very much.